Matter. Written by Ian M. Banks. Read by Toby Longworth. Prologue. A light breeze produced a dry, rattling sound from some nearby bushes. It lifted delicate little veils of dust from a few sandy patches nearby, and shifted a lock of dark hair across the forehead of the woman sitting on the wooden canvas camp chair, which was perched, not quite level, on a patch of bare rock near the edge of a low ridge looking out over the scrub and sand of the desert. In the distance, trembling through the heat haze, was the straight line of the road. Some scrawny trees, few taller than one man standing on another's shoulders, marked the course of the dusty highway. Further away, tens of kilometres beyond the road, a line of dark, jagged mountains shimmered in the baking air. By most human standards, the woman was tall, slim, and well-muscled. Her hair was short and straight and dark, and her skin was the colour of pale agate. There was nobody of her specific kind within several thousand light-years of where she sat, though if there had been, they might have said that she was somewhere between being a young woman and one at the very start of middle age. They would, however, have thought she looked somewhat short and bulky. She was dressed in a pair of wide, loose-fitting pants and a thin, cool-looking jacket, both the same shade as the sand. She wore a wide black hat to shade her from the late morning sun, which showed as a harsh white point high in the cloudless, pale green sky. She raised a pair of very old and worn-looking binoculars to her night-dark eyes and looked out towards the point where the desert road met the horizon to the west. There was a folding table to her right holding a glass and a bottle of chilled water. A small backpack lay underneath. She reached out with her free hand and lifted the glass from the table, sipping at the water while still looking through the ancient field glasses. They're about an hour away, said the machine floating to her left. The machine looked like a scruffy metal suitcase. It moved a little in the air, rotating and tipping as though looking up at the seated woman. And anyway, it continued, you won't see much at all with those museum pieces. She put the glass down on the table again and lowered the binoculars. They were my father's, she said. Really? The drone made a sound that might have been a sigh. A scream flicked into existence a couple of metres in front of the woman, filling half her field of view. It showed, from a point a hundred metres above and in front of its leading edge, an army of men, some mounted, most on foot, marching along another section of the desert highway, all raising dust which piled into the air and drifted slowly away to the southeast. Sunlight glittered off the edges of raised spears and pikes. Banners, flags, and pennants swayed above. The army filled the road for a couple of kilometres behind the mounted men at its head. Bringing up the rear were baggage carts, covered and open wagons, wheeled catapults and trebuchets, and a variety of lumbering wooden siege engines, all pulled by dark, powerful-looking animals whose sweating shoulders towered over the men walking at their sides. The woman tutted. Put that away. Yes, ma'am, the machine said. The screen vanished. The woman looked through the binoculars again, using both hands this time. I can see their dust, she announced. And another couple of scouts, I think. Astounding, the drone said. She placed the field glasses on the table, pulled the brim of her hat down over her eyes, and settled back in the camp seat, folding her arms and stretching her booted feet out, crossed at the ankle. Having a snooze, she told the drone from beneath the hat. Wake me when it's time. Just make yourself comfortable there, the drone told her. Mm-hmm. Temindazus, drone offensive, watched the woman, Zan Siri Anaplian, for a few minutes, monitoring her slowing breathing and her gradually relaxing muscle state until it knew she was genuinely asleep. Sweet dreams, princess, it said quietly. Reviewing its words immediately, the drone was completely unable to determine whether a disinterested observer would have detected any trace of sarcasm or not. It checked round its half-dozen previously deployed scout and secondary knife missiles, using their sensors to watch the still distant approaching army draw slowly closer, and to monitor the various small patrols and individual scouts the army had sent out ahead of it. For a while, it watched the army move. From a certain perspective, it looked like a single great organism, inching darkly across the tawny sweep of desert. Something segmented, hesitant, Bits of it would come to a stop for no obvious reason for long moments before starting off again, so that it seemed to shuffle rather than flow en masse. But 
determined, unarguably fixed on its onward purpose. And all on their way to war, the drone thought sourly, to take and burn and loot and rape and raise. What sullen application these humans devoted to destruction. About half an hour later, when the front of the army was hazily visible on the desert highway a couple of kilometres to the west, a single mounted scout came riding along the top of the ridge, straight towards where the drone kept vigil and the woman slept. The man showed no sign of having seen through the camouflage field surrounding their little encampment, but unless he changed course, he was going to ride right into them. The drone made a tutting noise, very similar to the one the woman had made earlier, and told its nearest knife missile to spook the mount. The pencil-thin shape came darting in, effectively invisible, and jabbed the beast in one flank so that it screamed and jerked, nearly unseating its rider as it veered away down the shallow slope of ridge towards the road. The scout shouted and swore at his animal, reining it in and turning its broad snout back towards the ridge, some distance beyond the woman and the drone. They galloped away, leaving a thin trail of dust hanging in the near still air. Jan Syrianaplian stirred, sat up a little, and looked out from under her hat. What was all that? she asked drowsily. Nothing. Go back to sleep. Hmm. She relaxed again, and a minute later was quietly snoring. The drone woke her when the head of the army was almost level with them. It bobbed its front at the body of men and animals a kilometre distant, while Annapolean was still yawning and stretching. The boys are all here, it told her. Indeed they are. She lifted the binoculars and focused on the very front of the army, where a group of men rode mounted on especially tall, colourfully caparisoned animals. These men wore high-plumed helmets, and their polished armour glittered brightly in the glare. They're all very parade ground, Annapolean said. It's like they're expecting to bump into somebody out here they need to impress. God, the drone suggested. The woman was silent for a moment. Hmm, she said eventually. She put the field glasses down and looked at the drone. Shall we? Merely say the word. Annapolean looked back at the army, took a deep breath and said, Very well, let us do this. The drone made a little dipping motion like a nod. A small hatch opened in its side. A cylinder, perhaps four centimetres wide and twenty-five long, shaped like a sort of conical knife, rolled lazily into the air, then darted away, keeping close to the ground and accelerating quickly towards the rear of the column of men, animals and machines. It left a trail of dust for a moment before it adjusted its altitude, and Appleian lost sight of its camouflage shape almost immediately. The drone's aura field, invisible until now, glowed rosily for a moment or two. This it said, should be fun. The woman looked at it dubiously. There aren't going to be any mistakes this time, are there? Certainly not, the machine said crisply. Want to watch? it asked her. I mean properly, not through those antique opera glasses. An Appleian looked at the machine through narrowed eyes for a little, then said slowly, All right. The screen blinked into existence just to one side of them this time, so that an Appleian could still see the army in the distance with the naked eye. The screen view was from some distance behind the great column now, and much lower than before. Dust drifted across the view. That's from the trailing scout missile, Tamindazus said. Another screen flickered next to the first. This is from the knife missile itself. The camera in the knife missile registered the tiny machine scudding past the army in a blur of men, uniforms and weapons then showed the tall shapes of the wagons, war machines, and siege engines, before banking sharply after the tail end of the army was passed. The rushing missile stooped, taking up a position a kilometre behind the rear of the army, and a metre or so above the road surface. Its speed had dropped from near supersonic to something close to that of a swiftly flying bird. It was closing rapidly with the rear of the column. I'll sink the scout to the knife, follow it in behind, the drone said. In moments, the flat circular base of the knife missile appeared as a dot in the centre of the scout missile's view, then expanded until it looked like the smaller machine was only a metre behind the larger one. There go the warps, Zuz said, sounding excited. See? Two arrowhead shapes, one on either side, detached from the knife missile's body, swung out and disappeared. The monofilament wires which still attached each of the little warps to the knife missile were invisible. 
The view changed as the scout missile pulled back and up, showing almost the whole of the army ahead. I'll get the knife to buzz the wires, the drone said. What does that mean? Vibrates them, so that whatever the monophils go through, it'll be like getting sliced by an implausibly sharp battle axe rather than the world's keenest razor, the drone said helpfully. The screen displaying what the scout missile could see showed a tree a hundred meters behind the last trundling wagon. The tree jerked, and the top three quarters slid at a steep angle down the sloped stump that was the bottom quarter before toppling to the dust. That took a flick, the drone said, glowing briefly rosy again and sounding amused. The wagons and siege engines filled the view coming from the knife missile. The first bit's actually the trickiest. The fabric roofs of the covered wagons rose into the air like released birds. Tensed hoops of wood, cut, sprang apart. The giant, solid wheels of the catapults, trebuchets, and siege engines shed their top sections on the next revolution, and the great wooden structures thudded to a halt, the top halves of some of them also cut through, jumping forward with the shock. Arm-thick lengths of rope, wound rock-tight a moment earlier, burst like released springs, then flopped like string. The scout missile swung between the felled and wrecked machines as the men in and around the wagons and siege engines started to react. The knife missile powered onwards, towards the foot soldiers immediately ahead. It plunged into the mass of spears, pikes, pennant poles, banners and flags, scything through them in a welter of sliced wood, falling blades and flapping fabric. An Appleon caught glimpses of a couple of men slashed or skewered by falling pike heads. Bound to be a few casualties the drone muttered. Bound to me, the woman said. The knife missile was catching glimpses of confused faces as men heard the shouts of those behind them and turned to look. The missile was a half-second away from the rear of the mass of mounted men and roughly level with their necks when the drone sent, Are you sure we can't? Positive, Napoleon replied, inserting a sigh into what was an entirely non-verbal exchange. Just stick to the plan. The tiny machine nudged up a half-metre or so, and tore above the mounted men, catching their plumed helmets and chopping the gaudy decorations off like a harvest of motley stalks. It leapt over the head of the column, leaving consternation and fluttering plumage in its wake. Then it zoomed, heading skywards. The following scout missile registered the monophyll warps clicking back into place in the knife missile's body before it swivelled, rose, and slowed to look back at the whole army again. It was, an Appleon thought, a scene of entirely satisfactory chaos, outrage, and confusion. She smiled. This was an event of such rarity that Taminda Zeus recorded the moment. The screens hanging in the air disappeared. The knife missile reappeared and swung into the offered hatchway in the side of the drone. An Appleon looked out over the plain to the road and the halted army. Many casualties? she asked, smile disappearing. Sixteen or so the drone told her. About half will likely prove fatal, in time. She nodded, still watching the distant column of men and machines. Oh, well. Indeed, Tamindazus agreed. The scout missile floated up to the drone and also entered via a side panel. Still, the drone said, sounding weary. We should have done more. Should we? Yes. You ought to have let me do a proper decapitation. No. An Appleon said. Just the nobles, the drone said. The guys right at the front. The ones who came up with their spiffing war plans in the first place. No, the woman said again, rising from her seat and, turning, folding it. She held it in one hand. With the other she lifted the old pair of binoculars from the table. Module coming? Overhead, the drone told her. It moved round her and picked up the camp table placing the glass and water bottle inside the backpack beneath. Just the two nasty dukes? And the king? An Appleon held on to her hat as she looked straight up, squinting briefly in the sunlight until her eyes adjusted. No. This is not, I trust, some kind of transferred familial sentimentality, the drone said with half-pretended distaste. No, the woman said, watching the shape of the module ripple in the air a few metres away. Taminda Zust moved towards the module as its rear doors hinged open. And are you going to stop saying no to me all the time? An Appleon looked at it, expressionless. Never mind, the drone said, sighing. 
It Bob nodded towards the open module door. After you. The Expeditionary Chapter 1 Factory The place had to be some sort of old factory or workshop or something. There were big toothed metal wheels half buried in the wooden floors or hanging by giant spindles from the network of iron beams overhead. Canvas belts were strung all over the dark spaces, connecting smaller, smooth wheels and a host of long, complicated machines he thought might be something to do with weaving or knitting. It was all very dusty and grimy-looking. And yet, this had been that modern thing, a factory. How quickly things decayed and became useless. Normally, he would never have considered going anywhere near some place so filthy. It might not even be safe, he thought. Even with all the machinery stilled, one gable wall was partially collapsed. Bricks tumbled, planks splintered, rafters hanging disjointed from above. He didn't know if this was old damage from deterioration and lack of repair, or something that had happened today during the battle. In the end, though, he hadn't cared what the place was or had been. It was somewhere to escape to, a place to hide. Well, to regroup, to recover, and collect himself. That put a better gloss on it. Not running away, he told himself, just staging a strategical retreat, or whatever you called it. Outside, the Rollstar Pentrill, having passed over the horizon a few minutes earlier, it was slowly getting dark. Through the breach in the wall he could see sporadic flashes and hear the thunder of artillery, the crump and bellowing report of shells landing uncomfortably close by, and the sharp, busy rattle of small arms fire. He wondered how the battle was going. They were supposed to be winning, but it was also confusing. For all he knew, they were on the brink of complete victory or utter defeat. He didn't understand warfare, and having now experienced its practice firsthand, had no idea how people kept their wits about them in a battle. A big explosion nearby made the whole building tremble. He whimpered as he crouched down, pressing himself still further into the dark corner he had found on the first floor, drawing his thick cloak over his head. He heard himself make that pathetic, weak little sound and hated himself for it. Breathing under the cloak, he caught a faint odour of dried blood and faeces, and hated that, too. He was Ferbin Oates Els Horske, a prince of the House of Horsk, son of King Horsk, the conqueror. And while he was his father's son, he had not been raised to be like him. His father gloried in war and battle and dispute, had spent his entire life aggressively expanding the influence of his throne and his people, always in the name of the world god and with half an eye on history. The king had raised his eldest son to be like him, but that son had been killed by the very people they were fighting perhaps for the last time today. His second son, Furbin, had been schooled in the arts not of war, but of diplomacy. His natural place was supposed to be in the court, not the parade ground, fencing stage, or firing range, still less the battlefield. His father had known this, even if he had never been as proud of Furbin as he had of Elim, his murdered first son. He had accepted that Furbin's skill, and you might even term it his calling, Furbin had thought that more than once, lay in the arts of politicking, not soldiering. It was, anyway, what his father had wanted. The king had been looking forward to a time when the martial heroics he had had to undertake to bring this new age about would be seen for the rude necessities they had been. He had wanted at least one of his sons to fit easily into a coming era of peace, prosperity, and contentment, where the turning of a pretty phrase would have more telling effect than the twisting of a sword. It was not his fault, Furbin told himself, that he was not cut out for war. It was certainly not his fault that, realising he might be about to die at any moment, he had felt so terrified earlier. And even less to his discredit, that he had lost control of his bowels when that Yilim chap, he had been a major or a general or something, had been obliterated by the cannon shot. Dear God, the man had been talking to him when he'd just gone, cut in half. Their small group had ridden up to a low rise for a better look at the battle. This was a modestly insane thing to do in the first place, Furbin had thought at the time, exposing them to enemy spotters and hence to still greater risk than that from a random artillery shell. 
For one thing, he'd chosen a particularly outstanding Mercy Court charger as his mount that morning from the abroad tents of the royal stable. A pure white beast with a high and proud aspect, which he thought he would look well on. Only to discover that General Major Yilim's choice of mount obviously pitched in the same direction, for he rode a similar charger. Now he thought about it, and, oh, the number of times he'd had cause to use that phrase or one of its cousins at the start of some explanation in the aftermath of yet another embarrassment, Furbin wondered at the wisdom of riding onto an exposed ridge with two such conspicuous beasts. He had wanted to say this, but then decided he didn't know enough about the procedures to be followed in such matters actually to speak his mind, and anyway he hadn't wanted to sound like a coward. Perhaps Major General or General Major Yilim had felt insulted that he'd been left out of the front-line forces and asked instead to look after Furbin, keeping him close enough to the action so that he'd later be able to claim that he'd been there at the battle, but not so close that he risked actually getting involved with any fighting. From the rise, when they achieved it, they could see the whole sweep of the battleground, from the great tower ahead in the distance, over the downland, spreading out from the kilometres wide cylinder, and up towards their position on the first fold of the low hills that carried the road to Poole itself. The Saal capital city lay behind them, barely visible in the misty haze, a short day's ride away. This was the ancient county of Zillisk, and these were the old playgrounds of Furbin and his siblings. Long depopulated lands turned into royal parks and hunting grounds, filled with overgrown villages and thick forests. Now, all about, their crumpled, riven geography sparkled with the fire of uncounted thousands of guns. The land itself seemed to move and flow where troop concentrations and fleets of warcraft manoeuvred, and great sloped stems of steam and smoke lifted into the air above it all, casting massive wedged shadows across the ground. Here and there, beneath the spread of risen mists and lowering cloud, dots and small winged shapes moved above the great battle, as Corge and Lidge, the great venerable war beasts of the sky, spotted for artillery and carried intelligence and signals from place to place. None seemed mobbed by clouds of lesser avians, so most likely they were all friendly. Poor fare compared to the days of old, though, when flocks, squadrons, whole clouds of the great beasts had contended in the battles of the ancients. Well, if the old stories and ancient paintings were to be believed, Furbin suspected they were exaggerated, and his younger half-brother, Oromen, who claimed to study such matters, had said, well, of course they were exaggerated, though, being Oromen, only after shaking his head at Furbin's ignorance. Shubris Hulse, his servant, had been to his left on the ridge, digging into a saddlebag and muttering about requiring some fresh supplies from the nearest village behind them. Major, or General, Yilim, had been on his right, holding forth about the coming campaign on the next level down, taking the fight to their enemies in their own domain. Furbin had ignored his servant and turned to Yilim out of politeness. Then, mid-word, with a sort of tearing rush of sound, the elderly officer, portly, a little flushed of face, and inclined to wheeze when laughing, was gone. Just gone. His legs and lower torso still sat in the saddle, but the rest of him was all ripped about and scattered. Half of him seemed to have thrown itself over Furbin, covering him in blood and greasily unknowable bits of body parts. Furbin had stared at the remains still sitting in the saddle as he wiped some of the gore off his face, gagging with the stink and the warm, steaming feel of it. His lunch had left his belly and mouth like something was pursuing it. He'd coughed, then wiped his face with a gore-slicked hand. Fucking hell! he heard Shubris Hulse say, voice breaking. Yilim's mount, the tall, pale, merciful charger, which Yilim had spoken to more kindly than to any of his men, as though suddenly realising what had just happened, screamed, reared, and fled, dumping what was left of the man's body onto the torn-up ground. Another shell, or ball, or whatever these ghastly things were, landed nearby, felling another two of their group in a shrieking tangle of men and animals. His servant had gone too now, Furbin realised. Mount toppled, falling on top of him. Shubris Hulse yelled with fright and pain, pinned beneath the animal. Sir! one of the junior officers shouted at him, suddenly in front of him, pulling his own mount round. Ride! 
Away from here! He was still wiping blood from his face. He'd filled his britches, he realized. He whipped his mount and followed the younger man, until the young officer and his mount disappeared in a sudden thick spray of dark earth. The air seemed to be full of screeches and fire, deafening, blinding. Thurbin heard himself whimper. He pressed himself against his mount, wrapping his arms round its neck and closing his eyes, letting the pounding animal find its own way over and around whatever obstacles were in its path, not daring to raise his head and look where they were going. The jarring, rattling, terrifying ride had seemed to last forever. He heard himself whimpering again. The panting, heaving Mercy Corps slowed eventually. Furbin opened his eyes to see they were on a dark, wooded track by the side of a small river. Booms and flashes came from every side, but sounded a little further away than they had. Something burned further up the stream, as though overhanging trees were on fire. A tall building, half-ruined, loomed in the late afternoon light, as the labouring, panting mount slowed still further. He pulled it to a stop outside the place and dismounted. He'd let go of the reins. The animal startled at another loud explosion, then went wailing off down the track at a canter. He might have given chase if his pants hadn't been full of his own excrement. Instead, he waddled into the building through a door wedged open by sagging hinges, looking for water and somewhere to clean himself. His servant would have known just what to do. Shubris Hulse would have cleaned him up as quick as you like, with much muttering and many grumblings, but efficiently and without a sly sneer. And now, Furbin realized, he was unarmed. The Mercico had made off with his rifle and ceremonial sword, plus the pistol he'd been given by his father, and which he had sworn would never leave his side while the war was waged, was no longer in its holster. He found some water and ancient rags and cleaned himself as best he could. He still had his wine flask, though it was empty. He filled the flask from a long trough of deep flowing water cut into the floor and rinsed his mouth, then drank. He tried to catch his reflection in the dark length of water, but failed. He dipped his hands in the trough and pushed his fingers through his long fair hair, then washed his face. Appearances had to be maintained, after all. Of King Horsk's three sons, he had always been the one who most resembled their father, tall, fair, and handsome, with a proud, manly bearing. So people said, apparently. He did not really trouble himself with such matters. The battle raged on beyond the dark, abandoned building as the light of Pentril faded from the sky. He found that he could not stop shaking. He still smelled of blood and shit. It was unthinkable that anyone should find him like this. And the noise! He'd been told the battle would be quick and they would win easily. But it was still going on. Maybe they were losing. If they were... It might be better that he hid. If his father had been killed in the fighting, he would, he supposed, be the new king. That was too great a responsibility. He couldn't risk showing himself until he knew they had won. He found a place on the floor above to lie down and tried to sleep, but could not. All he could see was General Yilim, bursting right in front of him, gobbets of flesh flying towards him. He retched once more, then drank from the flask. Just lying there, then sitting, his cloak pulled tight around him, made him feel a little better. It would be all right, he told himself. He'd take a little while away from things, just a moment or two, to collect his wits and calm down. Then he'd see how things were. They would have won, and his father would still be alive. He wasn't ready to be king. He enjoyed being a prince. Being a prince was fun. Being a king looked like hard work. Besides... His father had always entirely given everybody who'd ever met him the strong impression that he would most assuredly live forever. Furbin must have nodded off. There was noise down below, clamour, voices. In his jangled, still half-drowsy state, he thought he recognised some of them. He was instantly terrified that he would be discovered, captured by the enemy or shamed in front of his father's own troops. How low he had fallen in so short a time, to be as mortally afraid of his own side as of the enemy. Steel-shod feet clattered on the steps. He was going to be discovered. Nobody in the floors above, a voice said. Good, there. Lay him there. Doctor, 
there was some speech that Furbin didn't catch. He was still working out that he'd escaped detection while he'd been asleep. Well, you must do whatever you can. Blay, to Honlo, ride for help, as I've asked. Sir, at once. Priests, attend. The exulting, sir, will be with us in due course, I'm sure. For now, the duty's yours. Of course, sir. The rest of you, out. Give us some air to breathe here. He did know that voice. He was sure he did. The man giving the orders sounded like, in fact, must be, Tile Lospe. Mertis Tile Lospe was his father's closest friend and most trusted adviser. What was going on? There was much movement. Lanterns cast shadows from below onto the dark ceiling above him. He shifted towards a chink of light coming from the floor nearby, where a broad canvas belt, descending from a giant wheel above, disappeared through the planking to some machinery on the ground floor. Shifting, he could peer through the slit in the floor to see what was happening beneath. The God of the world. It was his father. King Horsk lay, face slack, eyes closed, on a broad wooden door resting on makeshift trestles immediately beneath. His armour was pierced and buckled over the left side of his chest, and blood was seeping through some flag or banner wrapped around him. He looked dead, or close to death. Furbin felt his eyes go wide. Dr. Gillews, the royal physician, was quickly opening bags and small portable cabinets. An assistant fussed beside him. A priest Furbin recognised but did not know the name of stood by his father's head, his white robe soiled with blood or mud. He was reading from some holy work. Mertis Till Lope, tall and partially stooped, still dressed in armour, his helmet held in one hand, his white hair matted, paced to and fro, armour glinting in the lantern light. The only others present that he could see were a couple of knights, standing, rifles held ready, by the door. The angle was wrong to see further up than the chests of the tall knight on the right side of the door, but Furbin recognised the one whose face he could see. Bower or Brower or something. He should reveal himself, he thought. He should let them know he was here. He might be about to become king, after all. It would be aberrant, perverse, not to make himself known. He would wait just a moment longer, all the same. He felt this like an instinct, he told himself, and his instinct had been right about not riding up onto the ridge earlier. His father's eyes flickered open. He grimaced with pain, one arm moving towards his injured side. The doctor looked at his assistant, who went to hold the king's hand, perhaps to comfort him, but certainly preventing him from probing his injury. The doctor joined his assistant, holding scissors and pliers. He cut cloth, pulled at armour. Bertus, the king said weakly, ignoring the doctor and holding his other hand out. His voice, usually so stern and strong, sounded like a child's. Here, Tyle Losp said, coming to the king's side. He took his hand. Do we prevail, Bertus? The other man looked round at the others present. Then he said, we prevail, sir. The battle is won. The Daldine have surrendered, and ask our terms. They conditioned only that their massacre cease, and they be treated honourably, which we have allowed so far. The ninth, and all that it holds, lies open to us. The king smiled. Furbin felt relieved. It sounded like things had gone well. He supposed he really ought to make his entrance now. He took a breath to speak, let them know he was there. And Furbin? the king asked. Furbin froze. What about him? Dead, Tyle Lospe said. It was said, Furbin thought, with somewhat insufficient grief or pity. Almost a chap less charitable than himself might have thought, with relish. Dead, his father wailed, and Furbin felt his eyes moisten. Now, now he needed to let his father know that his eldest surviving son still lived, whether he smelt of shit or not. Yes, Tyle Lospe said, leaning over the king. The vain, silly, spoiled little brat was blown to bits on Cherine Ridge some time after midday. A sad loss to his tailors, jewellers, and creditors, I dare say. As to anyone of consequence, well... The king made a spluttering noise, then said, Lospe, what are you... We are all of one mind here, are we not? 
Pylos said smoothly, ignoring the king, ignoring the king, and looking round everybody present. A chorus of low, muttered voices gave what must have been assent. Not you, priest, but no matter, Tyle Losp told the holy man. Continue with the reading, if you would. The priest did as he was instructed, eyes now wide. The doctor's assistant stared at the king, then glanced at the doctor, who was looking back at him. Losp, the king cried, something of his old authority back in his voice. What do you mean by this insult? And to my dead child? What monstrosity of— Oh, do be quiet. Tylos laid his helmet at his feet and leaned further forward, putting his knuckles to his cheeks and resting his mailed elbows on the king's armoured chest. An act of such unprecedented disrespect that Furbin found it almost more shocking than anything he'd heard. The king winced, breath wheezing out of him. Furbin thought he heard something bubbling. The doctor had finished exposing the wound in the king's side. I mean the cowardly little cunt is dead, you old cretin, Tyle Losp said, addressing his only lord and master as though he was a beggar. And if by some miracle he's not, he soon will be. The younger boy I think I'll keep alive for now, in my capacity as regent. Though, I'm afraid, poor, quiet, studious little Oramen may not live to the point of accession. They say the boy's interested in mathematics. I am not, save like yourself for its trajectorial role in the fall of shot. However, I'd compute his chances of seeing his next birthday, and hence majority, grow less substantial the closer the event creeps. What? the king gasped, laboring. Losp! Losp! For all pity! No, Tyle Losp said, leaning more heavily on the blood-bright curve of armour, causing the king to moan. No pity! my dear, dim old warrior. You've done your bit. You've won your war. That's monument and epitaph enough, and your time is past. But no pity, sir, no. I shall order all the prisoners of today killed with the utmost dispatch, and the ninth invaded with every possible severity, so that gutters, rivers, heavens, water wheels too, for all I care, run with blood. And the shrieking will, I dare say, be terrible to hear. All in your name, brave prince, for vengeance. For your idiot sons, too, if you like. Tyle Losp put his face very close to that of the king and shouted at him. The game is over, my old stump. It was always greater than you knew. He pushed himself back off the king's chest, making the prone man cry out again. Tyle Losp nodded at the doctor, who, visibly gulping, reached out with some metal instrument, plunging it into the wound in the king's side, making him shudder and scream. You traitors! You treacherous bastards! The king wept, as the doctor took a step back, instrument dripping blood, face grey. Will no one help me? Bastards all! You murder your king! Tile Losp shook his head staring first at the writhing king, then at the doctor. You ply your given trade too well, medic. He moved round to the other side of the king, who flailed weakly at him. As Tal Losp passed, the priest stuck out a hand, clutching at the nobleman's sleeve. Tal Losp looked calmly down at the hand on his forearm. The priest said hoarsely, Sir, this is too much. It's... it's wrong. Tal Losp looked at his eyes, then back at his clutching hand, until the priest released him. You stray your brief mumbler, Tyle Losp told him. Get back to your words. The priest swallowed, then lowered his gaze to the book again. His lips began to move once more, though no sound issued from his mouth. Tyle Losp moved round the broken door, shoving the doctor back, until he stood by the king's other flank. He crouched a little, inspecting. A mortal wound indeed, my lord, he said, shaking his head. You should have accepted the magic potions our friend Herlis offered. I would have. He plunged one hand into the king's side, arm disappearing almost to the elbow. The king shrieked. Why? 
Kyle Lost said. Here's the very heart of it. He grunted, twisting and pulling inside the man's chest. The king gave one final scream, arched his back, and then collapsed. The body jerked a few more times, and some sound came from his lips, but nothing intelligible. And soon they too were still. Furbin stared down. He felt frozen, immobilized, like something trapped in ice or baked to solidity. Nothing he had seen or heard or ever known had prepared him for this. Nothing. There was a sharp crack. The priest fell like a sack of rocks. Tyle Lope lowered his pistol. The hand holding it dripped blood. The doctor cleared his throat, stepped away from his assistant. Ah, uh, the boy, too, he told Tyle Lope, looking away from the lad. He shook his head and shrugged. He worked for the king's people as well as us, I'm sure. Master, I— the youth had time to say, before Tyle Lope shot him as well. In the belly first, folding him, then in the head. The doctor looked quite convinced that Tyle Lope was about to shoot him too, but Tyle Lope merely smiled at him and then at the two knights at the door. He stooped, took a towel from the waistband of the murdered assistant, wiped his pistol and his hand with it, then dabbed a little blood from his arm and sleeve. He looked round the others. This had to be done, as we all know he told them. He looked distastefully at the body of the king, as a surgeon might at a patient who has had the temerity to die on him. Kings are usually the first to talk, and at some length, of overarching destiny and the necessity of fulfilling greater purposes, he said, still wiping and dabbing. So let's take all that billowy rhetoric as heard, shall we? We are left with this. The king died of his wounds, most honorably incurred, but not before swearing bloody vengeance on his enemies. The prancing prince is dead, and the younger one is in my charge. These two here fell prey to a sniper, and will burn down this old place just for good measure. Now, come. All our fine prizes await. He threw the blooded towel down on the face of the felled assistant, and then said with an encouraging smile, I believe we are concluded here. Chapter 2 Palace Oriman was in a round room in the shade wing of the royal palace in Poole when they came to tell him that his father and his elder brother were dead, and he would in time be king. He had always liked this room because its walls described an almost perfect circle, and if you stood at its very centre, you could hear your own voice reflected back at you from the chamber's circumference in a most singular and interesting fashion. He looked up from his papers at the breathless earl who'd burst into the room and broken the news. The earl's name was Droffo from Schilder, if Oriman was not mistaken. Meanwhile, a couple of the palace servants piled into the room behind the nobleman, also breathing hard and looking flushed. Oriman sat back in his seat. He noticed it was dark outside. A servant must have lit the room's lamps. Dead, he said. Both of them? Are you sure? If all reports are to be believed, sir, from the army command and from Till Losp himself, the king is... The king's body is returning on a gun carriage, sir, Droffo told him. Sir, I'm sorry. It said poor Furbin was cut in half by a shell. I'm so sorry, sir, sorry beyond words. They are gone. Oriman nodded thoughtfully. But I'm not king. The earl who to Oriman looked dressed half for court and half for war, looked confused for a moment. No, sir, not until your next birthday. Tyle Losp will rule in your name, as I understand it. I see. Oriman took a couple of deep breaths. Well, now, he had not prepared himself for this eventuality. He wasn't sure what to think. He looked at Droffo. What am I supposed to do? What is my duty? This, too, seemed to flummox the good earl, just for an instant. Sir, he said, you might ride out to meet the king's beer. Oriman nodded. I might indeed. It is safe, sir. The battle is won. Yes, Oriman said. Of course. He rose and looked beyond Droffo to one of the servants. Puisil, the steam car, if you would. Take a little while to get steam up. 
Puisil said. Sir? Then don't delay, Oriman told him reasonably. The servant turned to go just as Fanthill, the palace secretary, appeared. A moment, Fanthill told the servant, causing Puisil to hesitate, his gaze flicking between the young prince and the elderly palace secretary. A charger might be the better choice, sir, Fanthill told Oriman. He smiled and bowed to Droffo, who nodded back at the older man. Fanthill was balding, and his face was heavily lined, but he was still tall and carried his thin frame proudly. You think? Oriman said. The car would be quicker, surely. The mount would be more immediate, sir, Fanthill said. And more fitting. One is more public on a mount. The people will need to see you. One could stand up in the back of my father's steam car, Oriman considered saying. But he saw the sense in what was being proposed. Also, Fanthill continued, seeing the prince hesitate and deciding to press, the road may be crowded. A mount will slip through spaces. Yes, of course, Oriman said. Very well. Pure yourself, if you would. Sir, the servant left. Oriman sighed and boxed his papers. His day had largely been taken up with working on a novel form of musical notation. He had been kept, with the rest of the household, in the cellars of the palace during the early morning, when the Deldeen had first been expected to break out from the nearby tower, in case things went badly and they had to flee through subterranean tunnels to a fleet of steam vehicles waiting ready in the city's lower reaches. But then they had been allowed out when, as expected, the enemy had been met with such prepared force that they had soon ceased to be a threat to the city, and their attention became focused instead on their own survival. Mid-morning, he'd been persuaded to climb to a balustraded roof with Sheer Rakas, his tutor, to look out over the stepped palace grounds and the higher reaches of the hilltop city towards the Siliskine Tower and the battleground that, telegraph reports now stated, stretched almost all around it. But there had been little to see. Even the sky had appeared entirely devoid of action. The great battle flocks of Cord and Lyg that had filled the ancient airs and made the battles of yesteryear seem so romantic were largely gone now, consigned, reduced, to scout patrols, messengering, artillery spotting, and raids that were little better than brigandry. Here on the 8th, such flying war beasts were widely held to have no significant part to play in modern ground battles, largely due to the machinery and accompanying tactics King Horsk himself had introduced. There had been rumours that the Deldeen had steam-powered flying machines, but if those had been present today, they must have been in small numbers, or had little obvious effect. Oriman had been mildly disappointed, though he thought the better of saying so to his old tutor, who was as patriotic, race-conscious, and world-godly as any might wish. They came down from the roof for what was supposed to be lessons. Chirakas was nearing retirement, but had anyway realised during the last short year that he had little to teach Oriman now, unless it was by rote straight out of a book. These days, the prince preferred to use the palace library unmediated, though he still listened to the old scholar's advice, not entirely out of sentimentality. He had left Rakas in the library, wrapped by some dusty set of scrolls, and made his way here, to the round room, where he was even less likely to be disturbed. Well, until now. Oriman, Renequay ran in, darting past Droffo and Fantil and flinging herself at his feet in a derangement of torn clothing. I just heard. It can't be true. Renequay, the Lady Silb, hooked her arms round his feet, hugging tight. She looked up, her young face livid with tears and grief, brown hair spilling. Say it's not. Please. Not both. Not the King and Furbin, too. Not both. Not both. For anything, not both. Oriman, leant down gently and pulled her up until she knelt before him, her eyes wide, her brows pulled in, her jaw working. He had always thought her rather attractive and been envious of his elder brother, but now he thought she looked almost ugly in this surfeit of grief. Her hands, having been deprived of the patent reassurance of his feet, now clutched at a plump little world symbol on a thin chain round her neck, twisting it round and round in her fingers, the filigree of smaller shells inside the spherical outer casing all revolving, sliding back and forth, continually adjusting. Oriman felt quite mature, even old, all of a sudden. Now, Remaquay, he said, taking her hands and patting them. We all have to die. The girl wailed, throwing herself to the floor again. Madam, Fanthill said, 
sounding kindly but embarrassed and reaching down to her, then turning to see Malach, one of the ladies of court, also looking tearful and distracted, appear in the doorway. Malach, perhaps twice Renique's age, face pitted with the tiny scars of a childhood infection, bit her lip when she saw the younger woman weeping on the wooden floor. Please, Van Hill said to Malach, indicating Renique. Malach persuaded Renique to rise, then to exit. Now, sir, Van Hill said, before turning to see Hahn, the Lady Elsh, the king's present consort and mother to Ferbin, standing in the doorway, her eyes red, fair hair straggled and unkempt, but clothing untorn, her face set and stance steady. Van Hill sighed. Madam, he began. Just confirm it, Van Hill, the lady said. Is it true? The two? Both of mine? Van Hill looked at the floor for a moment. Yes, my lady. Both gone. The king, most certainly. The prince, by all accounts. The lady Elsh seemed to sag, then slowly drew herself up. She nodded, then made as though to turn away, before stopping to look at Oriman. He looked straight back at her. He rose from his seat, still held by that gaze. Though they had both sought to conceal it, their mutual dislike was no secret in the palace. His was based on his own mother having been banished in Han's favour, while hers was generally assumed to be caused by Oriman's mere existence. Still, he wanted to say that he was sorry. He wanted to say, at least when he thought more clearly and logically about it later, that he felt for her double loss, that this was an unlooked-for and an unwanted promotion of his status, and that she would suffer no diminution of her own rank by any action or inaction of his either during the coming regency or following his own ascension. But her expression seemed to forbid him from speech, and perhaps even dared him to find anything that might be said that she would not find in some way objectionable. He struggled against this feeling for some moments, thinking that it was better to say something rather than seem to insult her with silence, but then gave up. There was a saying, Wisdom is silence. In the end, he simply bowed his head to the lady, saying nothing. He sensed as much, and saw her turn and leave. Oriman looked up again. Well, at least that was over. Come, sir, Van Hill said, holding out one arm. I'll ride with you. Will I be all right like this? Oriman asked. He was dressed most informally, in pants and shirt. Throw on a good cloak, sir, Van Hill suggested. He looked steadily at the younger man as he hesitated, patting the papers he had been working on, as though not sure whether to take them with him or not. You must be distraught, sir, the palace secretary said levelly. Oriman nodded. Yes, he said, tapping the papers. The topmost sheet was nothing to do with musical notation. As a prince, Oriman had of course been educated in the ways of the aliens who existed beyond his home level, and out with Susamon itself, and, idling earlier, He'd been doodling his name and then attempting to express it as those aliens might. Oriman, Lin, Blisk, Horsker, Yun, Pool, Yun, Dich. Oriman, Prince, three stroke two. Porlin, Brack, eight stroke SU. Schumann, Oriman, Prince of Pool, House of Horsk, Domain of Saal of the Eighth, Susaman. Messerafin, Susaman, stroke eight. S. A. Oramen, Lin, Brisk, Hosk, Dam, Pool. He reordered the pages, picked up a paperweight and placed it on the pile. Yes, I must, mustn't I? Just hoisting oneself aboard a Mercy Corps, it appeared, had become rather more complicated than it had ever been before. Oramen had hardly tarried since hearing the news, but even so a considerable fuss had already accrued in the lantern-lit mounting yard by the time he got there. Accompanied, harried might have been as fit a term, by Fanthill, Oriman had visited his apartments to grab a voluminous riding cloak, suffered Fanthill pulling a comb through his auburn hair, and then been rushed down the steps towards the yard, taking care to nod at the various grave faces and sets of ringing hands en route. He had only been held up once by the Oct Ambassador. The Ambassador looked like some sort of giant crab. Its upright, ovoid body, about the size of a child's torso, was coloured deep blue and covered with tiny bright green growths that were either thin spikes or thick hairs. Its thrice-segmented limbs, four hanging like legs, four 
seemingly taking the part of arms, were an almost incandescent red, and each terminated in small double claws, which were the same blue as the main body. The limbs protruded, not quite symmetrically, in broken-looking Z-shapes from four black stubs, which for some reason always reminded Oriman of fleshy cannon mouths. The creature was supported from the rear and sides by a frame of mirror-finished metal, with bulkier additions behind it, which apparently housed the means it used to hover soundlessly in mid-air, occasionally leaking small amounts of strangely scented liquid. A set of tubes led from another cylinder to what was assumed to be its face, set in the middle of its main body and covered with a sort of mask through which tiny bubbles could occasionally be seen to move. Its whole body glistened, and when you looked very closely, and Oriman had, you could see that a very thin membrane of liquid seemed to enclose every part of it, with the possible exception of its little green hairs and the blue claws. The Oct diplomatic mission was housed in an old ballroom in the palace's sunwing, and was apparently completely full of water. The ambassador and two escorting Oct, one slightly smaller and one a little larger than it, floated over the corridor tiles towards Oriman and Fanthill as they reached the final turn in the stairs. Fanthill stopped when he saw the creatures. Oriman thought better of not doing likewise. He heard the palace secretary sigh. Oriman, man, prince, ambassador Qui to Paul said. Its voice was that of dry leaves rustling or a small fire starting in tinder. That who gave that you might be given unto life is no more, as our ancestors, the blessed Involucra, who are no more, to us are. Grief is to be experienced there to related emotions and much. I am unable to share being. Nevertheless, and forbearance I commend unto you, one assumes, likely to assumption takes place. Fruitions! Energy transfers like inheritance, and so we share. You, we, as though in the way of pressure, in subtle conduits, we do not map well. Oriman stared at the thing, wondering what he was supposed to make of this apparent nonsense. In his experience, the ambassador's tangential utterances could be made to represent some sort of twisted sense if you thought about them long enough, preferably after writing them down, but he didn't really have the time just now. Thank you for your kind words, he blurted, nodding and backing towards the stairs. The ambassador drew back a fraction, leaving a tiny pool of moisture glistening on the tiles. Keep you. Go to that which you go to. Take that which I would give you. Knowing of a likeness. Oct. Inheritors. Descend from Vale. Inherit. You. Inherit. Also. Is pity. With your leave, sir, Fanthill said to the ambassador. Then he and Oriman bowed, turned, and went clattering down the last flight of stairs towards ground level. The fuss in the mounting yard mostly involved a whole blaring coven of dukes, earls, and knights, disputing loudly over who ought to ride with the Prince Regent on the short journey he was about to make to meet the body of the returning king. Oriman hung back in the shadows, arms folded, waiting for his mount to be brought before him. He stepped backwards into a pile of dung near the yard's tall rear wall and tutted, shaking some of the shit from his boot and attempting to scrape off the rest on the wall. The dung pile was still steaming. He wondered if he could tell what sort of animal had left the turd from its appearance and consistency. Probably, he imagined. He looked straight up at the sky. There, Still visible over the lanterns illuminating the mounting yard from the ensquaring walls, a dull red line marked the cooling course incised by the Rollstar Pentrel, many hours set and many days away from returning. He looked to the near pole, where Domity would rise next, but this was a relatively long night, and even the Rollstar's forelight was still some hours away. He thought he could see just a suggestion of the keen Yin Tower, stretching into the darkness above, the lower extent of the Zilliskeen, though nearer, was hidden by a tall tower of the palace. But he was not sure. Zilliskeen, or 213 Tower 52. That was the name their mentors, the Oct, would give it. He supposed he ought to prefer Zilliskeen. He returned his attention to the yard. So many nobles. He'd assume they'd all be out fighting the Deldine. But then... 
His father had long since drawn a firm distinction between those nobles who brought grace and emollients to a court, and those who were capable of successfully fighting a modern war. The levied troops, magnificently motley, led by their lords, still had their place, but the new army was part full-time professional and part well-trained people's militias, all of it commanded by captains, majors, colonels and generals, not knights, lords, earls and dukes. He spotted some senior priests and a few parliamentarians in the mixture too, pressing their suit for inclusion. He had fondly imagined riding out alone, or with one or two attendants. Instead, it looked like he would be leading out a small army of his own. Oriman had been advised not to have anything to do with the battle taking place out over the plains that day, and anyway had no real interest in it, given that they had all been most severely assured it was quite certain to go their way by Werribee one of his father's most forbidding generals, just the night before. It was a pity, in a way. Only a couple of years ago he'd have been fascinated by the machinery of war and all the careful dispositioning of forces involved. The intense numericality of its planning and the extreme functionality of its cruel workings would have consumed him. Somehow, though, since then, he'd lost interest in things, Marshal. They seemed, even as they were in the process of securing it, profoundly inimical to the modern age they'd helped usher in. War itself was becoming old-fashioned and outmoded. Inefficient, wasteful, fundamentally destructive, it would have no part in the glitteringly pragmatic future the greatest minds of the kingdom foresaw. Only people like his father would mourn such a passing. He would celebrate it. My prince, murmured a voice beside him. Ahriman turned. Tove, he said clapping the other man on the back. Tove Lomber had been his best friend almost since nursery. He was an army officer nowadays, and wore the uniform of the old flying corps. You're here! I thought you'd be fighting. How good to see you! They've had me in one of the Lige Towers the last few days, with a squadron of the beasts, light guns, in case there was an aerial attack. Listen, he put one hand on Oriman's arm. This is so bad about your father and Furbin. The stars would weep, Oriman. I can't tell you. All the men of the flight, well, we want you to know that we're at your command. Rather at Losps. He is your champion in this, Oriman. He'll serve you well, I'm sure. As am I. Your father, though, our dear king, our every... Toe's voice broke. He shook his head and looked away, biting his lip and sniffing hard. Oriman felt he had to comfort his old friend. Well, he died happy, I imagine, he said in battle, and victorious, as he'd have wished, as we'd all have wished. Anyway, he took a quick look round the melee in the yard. The contesting nobles seemed to be gathering themselves into some sort of order, but there was still no sign of his charger. He'd have been quicker in the steam car, after all. It is a shock, he continued. Tove was still looking away. I shall miss him. Miss him, well, terribly, obviously. Tove looked back at him. Oriman smiled broadly and blinked quickly. Truth be told, I think I'm like a half-stunned beast still walking around, but eyes crossed as wits. I fully expect to wake up at any moment. I'd do so now if it was in my power. When Tove looked back, his eyes were bright. I've heard that when the troops learned their beloved king was dead, they fell upon their captives and killed every one. I hope not, Oriman said. That was not my father's policy. They killed him, Oriman! Those beasts! Oh, I wish I'd been there too to take my own revenge! Well, neither of us were. We must hope what's been done in our name brings only honour. Tove nodded slowly, clutching Oriman's arm once more. You must be strong, Oriman, he said. Oriman gazed at his old friend. Strong, indeed. This was quite the most vapid thing Tove had ever said to him. Death obviously had an odd effect on people. So, Tove said with a sly, tentative smile, do we call you sire or majesty or something yet? Not yet, Oriman began, then was led away by an earl and assisted to his mount by dukes. On the Zillisk Road, near the small town of Evangreth, the cortege bearing the body of King Nereth Horsk back to his capital met with the barely smaller procession led by the Prince Oriman. Immediately he saw the Prince Regent, 
lit by hissing travel lanterns and the slow increasing forelight of the roll star Domity, still some hours from its dawn. Mertis Tile Lospe, who all the world knew had been like a third hand to the king for almost all his life, dismounted, and, pulling himself with heavy steps to the prince's charger, went down on one knee on the muddied road, head bowed, so that his silvery hair spiked and wild from the tearings of grief, and his distraught face, still dark with powder smoke and streaked by hot, unceasing tears, were level with the stirrup foot of the prince. Then he raised his head and said these words, Sir, our beloved master, the king, who was your father and my friend, and was friend and father to all his people, comes back to his throne in triumph, but also in death. Our victory has been great and complete, and our gain and new advantage immeasurable. Only our loss exceeds such vast accomplishment, but it does so by a ratio beyond calculation. Beside that hateful cost, for all its furious glory, our triumph these last hours now looks like nothing. Your father was full occasion for both. One would not have been but for his matchless leadership and steady purpose. The other was invoked by his untimely, unwanted, undeserved death. And so, it is fallen to me, and is my great if ever unlooked for privilege, to rule for the short interval between this most loathsome day and the glorious one of your accession. I beseech you, sir, believe me that whatever I do in your name, my lord, will be for you and the people of Saal, and always in the name of the world god. Your father would expect no less and in this cause, so great to us, I might begin to start some small repayment of the honour he did me. I honour you as I honoured him, sir, utterly, with all my being, with my every thought and every action, now and for as long as it is my duty so to do. I have today lost the best friend a man ever had, sir, a true light, a constant star whose fixity outshone, outstared any mere celestial lamp. The Saal have lost the greatest commander they have ever known, a name fit to be clamoured down the eons till time's end, and echo loud as that of any hero of the distant ancients amongst the unseen stars. We can never hope to be a tenth as great as he, but I take respite in only this. The truly great are strong beyond death itself, my lord, and, like the fading streak of light and heat a great star leaves behind it once its own true brilliance has been obscured, a legacy of power and wisdom remains, from which we may draw strength, by its focus magnifying our own small allotment of fortitude and will. Sir, if I seem to express myself inelegantly, or without the due respect I would give your station and yourself, forgive me. My eyes are blinded, my ears stopped, and my mouth made numb by all that's taken place today. To gain more than we thought possible, then lose an infinity more than even that, would have shattered any man, save only the one unmatched soul. It is a sad... Oh duty to bring before you here. Tylosp fell silent. Oriman knew he was expected to say something in return. He'd been doing his best to ignore the prattling dukes around him for the last half hour, after Fantil had briefly made it through the press of bodies, animal and human surrounding him, to warn him he might need to give a speech. The palace secretary had barely had time to impart even this morsel of advice before he and his mount were nudged and jostled out of the way, back to what the more splendid nobles obviously regarded as his proper place amongst the minor nobility, the dutifully wailing priests and dour-looking parliamentarians. Since then, Oriman had been trying to come up with something suitable. But what was he supposed to say or do? He glanced at the various resplendent nobles around him, all of whom, from their grave, almost exaggerated nods and mutterings, seemed to approve quite mightily of Mertis Tal Lope's speech. 
Oriman twisted briefly in his saddle to glimpse Fanthill, now still further back in the crush of junior nobles, priests and representatives, signalling with jerks of his head and jagged flaps of his hand that he ought to dismount. He did so. Already a small crowd of dismounted men and people, presumably from the nearby town and countryside, had gathered around them, filling the broad way and jostling for position on the roadside banks. The growing forelight, pre-dawn under a sky of scattered clouds, silhouetted some folk climbing nearby trees for a better view. He still had no idea what to say in return, though he suddenly thought what a fine subject for a painting such a scene might make. Ahriman took Tile Losp by one hand and got him to stand before him. Thank you for all you've said and done, dear Tile Losp, he told the older man. He was very aware of the contrast between the two of them. He, the slight prince, barely out of childish clothes and dressed beneath his thrown-back cloak, as though preparing for bed. The other, the all-powerful conquering warrior, still in his battle armour, flecked here and there with all the marks of war, three times his age and barely any younger or less impressive than the lately killed king. Harsh breathing, stern-faced, still stinking of blood and smoke, Bearing all the signs of mortal combat and unbearable grief, Tyle Loth towered over him. The drama of the scene was not lost on Oriman. This would make a good painting, he thought, especially by one of the old masters, say, de la Chere or Sordic, perhaps even Omoldio. And almost at the same moment, he knew what to do. He'd steal. Not from a painting, of course, but from a play. There were enough old tragedies with like scenes and suitable speeches for him to welcome back a dozen dead dads and doughty combatiers. The choice was more daunting than the task it might relieve. He'd recall, pick, edit, join, and extemporize his way through the moment. This is indeed our saddest day, Oriman said, raising his voice and his head. If any energies of yours could bring our father back, I know you'd devote them to that cause without stint. That vigour instead will be turned to the good interest of all our people. You bring us sorrow and joy at once, my good Tile Losp. But for all the misery we feel now, and for all the time we must rightly hence devote to the mourning of our incomparable fallen, the satisfaction of this great victory will still shine brightly when that right has been most fully observed, and my father would surely want it so. The sum of his most glorious life was cause for fervent celebration well before the great triumph of this day, and the weight of that result has grown only more majestic with the exploits of all who fought for him before the Zilliskine Tower. Oriman looked round the gathered people for a moment at this point, and attempted to raise his voice still further. My father took one son to war today, and left one, myself, at home. I have lost both a father and a brother, as well as my king and his loved and rightful heir. They outshine me in death as they did in life, and Myrtis Tile Losp, though having no lack of other responsibilities, must stand in place of both for me. I tell you, I can think of no one more fitted to the task. Oriman nodded towards the grim-faced warrior in front of him. Then he took a breath and, still addressing the assembled mass, said, I know I have no share of this day's glory. I think my boyish shoulders would fail beneath the smallest part of such a load. But I am proud to stand with all the Saal people, to celebrate and to honour the great deeds done, and pay the fullest respect to one who taught us celebration, encouraged us to honour, and exemplified respect. This fetched a cheer, which rose raggedly, then with increasing strength from the congregation of people gathered around them. Oriman heard shields being struck by swords, mailed fists beating on armoured chests, and, like a modern comment on such flowery antiquity, the loud crack of small arms fire, round spent into the air like some inverted hail. Myrtis Tile Losp, who had kept a stony face during Oriman's reply, looked very briefly surprised, even alarmed at its end. But that briefest of impressions, which might so easily have been the result of the uncertain light cast by the carried travel lanterns and the wan glow of a still unrisen minor star, 